Ever wonder how a lift station keeps wastewater moving without a hitch? Today we are diving into a real-world PLC ladder logic program that controls pump alternation, monitors level with a transducer, and has float switch backup for safety. By the end of this walkthrough, you will have a clear understanding of how this system works and the logic behind it. And here's the kicker. At the end of this video, I'll reveal an often overlooked best practice that could save you hours of troubleshooting and even prevent expensive downtime. Let's jump into it. Let's look at the components that goes into a pump station. The control panel, level control, obviously the pumps, and then there's valves and chambers. Okay, so the level control in this project is based on a submersible pressure transducer, or it could be an ultrasonic. Either way, that gives us an analog signal to use for better control of the level. It also has float switches for backup. These float switches, which there are four of them, for high, high alarm, low, and low alarm. From there, you have alternation between the two pumps, and this is simply done to share the load and give some redundancy to the system. Now to the program walkthrough that you've been waiting for. This is the program's main ladder routine. And its basic function is on the very first pass, a system bit is set for one cycle of the program to unlatch the pump controls and clear any digital outputs, system bits, or faults so that when the system is power cycled, it comes up without any conditions that would be unsafe for operations. Scrolling up to rung two, three, four, five, six, what you're looking at is the purpose of the main, which is to go into other subroutines or programs, depending on the ladder logic application that you're using. This, this one happens to be Alan Bradley's RS Logics 500. And you'll see that each one of these subroutines have a purpose. Set IO, level control, faults, pump alternation, and alarming. The last is simply a move that takes the digital word that I use for the outputs and move them to the physical outputs at the end of each scan. All right, let's look at ladder four, the level control. So in the first rung, we're just using the scale function continuously that takes the raw value of the analog input where the transducer is connected and scaling it to the range of the transducer or submersible transducer to tell us what the level is in feet. Next, the transducer fault condition is looking at when the range that the scale is trying to scale to is below, for example, in a low transducer fault condition and the value is too high for a high transducer fault condition. Now you'll see on ladder three that we are doing a greater than for the scaled value based on the F8 colon one, which is the user set point for when they want the level to turn on. As you can see, if there's a transducer fault, this can't be done. And once, if there is no transducer fault, a timer will verify for three seconds that we are greater than that value in order to be done and set the call to run. You'll notice that the call to run is a latch condition. Right below that, on ladder four, is another greater than. It's doing the same thing as we just described on ladder three, except we are going to look at a set point that is a lag or turn both pumps on condition. It's the same scenario, only the bit that we're latching, if the timer's true for more than three seconds, is run both pumps. The last rung for the level control is number five, which is going to basically unlatch those call to runs that we just latched due to high level. So essentially it's the opposite. We are comparing the level to a user set point and saying if it is less than, 
then, after a verification of three seconds, unlatch those bits that we used for call to run and run both pumps. You'll also notice a branch around that lesser than that's based on the low float switch. This is what I was mentioning earlier about a safety. If that bit is true, examined if opened, it will do the same thing and stop both call to runs to prevent the pump from running dry and damaging them. Now we're looking at ladder five fault tests. The purpose of the fault test is to look at external inputs from devices. So you'll see on rung zero that we're looking at the pump one seal fail. If it's true for three seconds, we latch a bit called seal fail. Same thing for the over temp and also for pump one fault. And inside of that, we will have a condition where we can reset these faults. In this particular situation, I kind of made it simple so that it can either be done remotely through an HMI screen or SCADA or by toggling the selector switch for handoff auto out of auto and back into auto and it'll clear that fault. The same is done for pump two, seal, over temp, the general fault condition, and also the reset. So now that we're at run 10, once you notice that that's just another fault that comes from an external device called generator, we're going to do the same thing. That three second timer is just a delay to debounce the potential of any little surges that might cause it to get into a fault condition. Now we're on rung six, pump alternation. This is the fun one. This is the one where we take those pump run commands and we examine some different conditions related to whether the pump is faulted, which pump's in auto, which pump has lead, and we do alternation from when one pump starts so that the next pump alternates to be the lead in the next cycle. So if we walk through this rung zero, you'll notice it's calling to run. Pump one and pump two are both in auto. If that be in the case, which one has permission to run? Pump one is lead and down below that is the condition for run both pumps. That being said, we push on to the next part of that branch, which is pump general faults which we have none. At this point, we're going to actually call for a digital output for pump one to run, which I call pump one run command. Looking at the lower branch for the pump two auto, we see that both pumps are called. There's no general fault for pump two, which means that pump two run command is also set. Right below that on rung one, you'll notice that it is doing the opposite of the pump call to run. So that when our conditions we mentioned earlier with the level control was not true, we will unlatch that pump call to run, which means this examine if open is true, then we will go over and unlatch the pump one control, the pump two control, and depending on which pump alternation bit is true, we will set either pump one as lead or pump two as lead. There is a small section here for aeration control. And the only thing we're doing here is taking the aerator timer preset, which is set by the user in seconds, moving it to a timer and then examining that to say if pump call to run is not true, pump one run status is not true, and pump two run status is not true for the preset, then we will call for the aerator to be ran. Here at rung eight, we're going to utilize some of the fault conditions that we looked at fault test and use those to stop whichever pump is in a fault condition. But only when the pump one, pump one run control command is set true, do we look at these conditions and, and terminate pump one operation. And you'll also notice that within that logic is the state that says call for pump two to run and also try one time to reset fault for pump two. And then we do the same thing for the pump two fault control, basically with the exact same setup and looks at setting one if it's faulted. Now let's look at alarms. Ladder number seven. If we have a pump one general fault and we have pump two general fault, this is where we need to set alarm lights and horns and notify the HMI through setting a bit that both pumps are faulted and alarming. Next, we look at the water level alarms and do similar to what we did for the level control. But in this situation, we're more concerned about is the level above or below our high level. On ladder two, similarly, to drive the light and horn, 
that high alarm that we verified for three seconds through the transducer is a, capable of turning on the alarm light and horn. And also a branch is wrapped around that input for the high float switch that can also set that high alarm. Right below that on rung three is the horn silence input, which is a one shot to unlatch the horn. Rung four is similar to the high level in that now we're looking at the low level for an alarm condition from the transducer. Same thing, wait three seconds, set a bit. These are conditions that will clear themselves. They're not latching and have to be unlatched like the others. Rung five is that high float switch that we showed being used above. It's actually waiting five seconds before it verifies it. Rung six is the low float switch, waiting five seconds before it's set. And then these next rung seven, run eight, run nine, and run 10 are actually driving the fault that was defined at the fault test to set output for light on the control panel. So that's it, we've walked through the program. If there's anything that you're not clear on, please drop a comment below and I will try to answer it. Also, there is a problem with the program. If you noticed it, post a comment and let me know. I'd love to see how long it takes for somebody to find it. As I alluded to in the beginning, is the reason why it's structured in the program files to say main, set IO, level control, fault testing, pump alternation, and alarms. This is important, especially someone that's new to programming, is to write their ladder logic in such a way that it has a flow so that when you do a group of function, that group function has meaning. The main tells you to go through all the other subroutines. The set IO is where you set up your IO. The level control is the devices used to control the level. The test faults, I don't know, you could emerge test fault with alarms. Pump alternation is where the alternation happens. And then of course alarms is where our alarms go out. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. And I do look forward to hearing if anyone figures out where the problem was in the ladder logic.